production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, Meet a Columbus artist who has branched out into making handmade face masks. Experience the festive holiday lighting display at the Columbus Commons. You can't miss the lights. I think you could see them from space. 400,000 LED lights in every color imaginable. And I'll whip up a fruity and boozy beverage with the help of a local animator. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. For our first story tonight, we'd like to introduce you to a local artist who, as a result of the pandemic, turned her talents toward making face masks. Michelle Ishida's love of trees and nature shows through in her original designs that are screen printed and then sewn into masks and other items. Here's her story. I've always been interested in art. You know, my family liked art and music. It was always part of our lives. And I played the piano since I was six. And I've also always drawn and painted. And eventually I realized like, well, you're not gonna be a classical pianist because you're not gonna practice six hours a day. And so that just became more of like, you know, a love that I did on the side and I majored in art. While I was in school, started sewing, besides doing all of my painting and printmaking, because printmaking was my focus. Sewing was just something I did for myself because I like fashion, so I was always making myself hats and dresses and wearing them all over. It was a store on campus, um, and it was called Atlantis, and the lady there was Peggy Berry, and she said, oh, where did you get those hats, you know? And I'm like, oh, I make them, you know? So then she bought those and then she bought some dresses. So that is how I started selling things and making um, fashion as part of my art. Because printmaking in school, you know, is on paper, but it was just fun for me to print on fabric and be able to wear it. I love silhouettes. I started to draw basically trees first because I love tree silhouettes. Bare branches to me are beautiful because they're so graceful. I think I just like the whole graphic 2D image of something. And I like lines and shape. I just find it really peaceful and meditative to look at. So when I see it in nature, I just want to interpret that into my art so that other people will get that same feeling. Since I print and I make, you know, t-shirts and hoodies and messenger bags and I make my own fabric, they all have the theme of nature and trees and animals and I try to use, you know, eco-friendly products. Like I will, I'll use upholstery fabric samples. Um, there's a furniture store that saves them for me. So that's a really nice relationship. Um, and then, you know, the messenger bags will be made out of part new fabric because I always print on new cotton canvas. It's just the best and it's, I need something to be consistent and then I will add the pieces of recycled fabric with that to give it variety and make them unique. I was all ready for the art season this year and I had all these festivals lined up and then the pandemic hit 
So I just had to basically shut down. I felt frozen because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was going to happen. So I thought, well, we need masks. Everyone's making masks. This looks fun. Let's make some masks. And it just gave a whole bunch away to friends and family. And then they would call and say, hey, my friend needs like 10 masks. Can you make some for them? And I thought, well, sure. Let's just start making masks. So that's when I was, you know, I had the idea to put my design on the fabric to make it more unique. It just became the replacement for my festival income, honestly. Like, it really saved my year. The pandemic itself did help me um, just come to, I don't know, just come to terms with a lot of things like what is really important to you? And I think a lot of people feel the same way. And the silver lining of it, you know, with the making of the masks uh, was just how much people appreciated them. Ta-da! I would get lovely messages and they would post pictures of themselves in their mask and it's like, well, if we've got to wear them, at least it's cute. I think it's a great example of form and functionality and that's one of our goals as artists a lot of times you know it's something very useful helpful um, protective and also you know it's cute so you can kind of bond with it the most important thing for me with my art is that it has a healing aspect to it. I think nature is very important for healing and um, a lot of times when I do have shows, because I think about nature and trees and you know observing and being connected with nature, my customers that come in, we have really great conversations about this tree that was in our backyard my whole life, my whole childhood, or oh, this beautiful tree that I see in this field every time I drive to this place, and they'll tell me where it is, you know, and I'll write it down because I'm like, I'm gonna go see it. Yeah, it's just that connection and the healing, and then you feel, you know, gratitude just for your life. For me, healing is one of the main components of art and music, both. Michelle posts all of her face masks as well as hats, handbags, and other custom apparel on her Etsy shop. You can find her at Starfish Earth Clothes. If you're still looking for a safe way to celebrate the holiday season this year, then this next story is for you. Enjoy this tour of the 400,000 LED lights that have lit up the Columbus Commons. I spoke with Amy Taylor of the Downtown Development Corporation to learn more about this dazzling downtown lighting display, which celebrates its 10th anniversary this year. Well, Amy, thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm excited to learn more. Great. Um, thank you for having me. Of course. So where exactly is the display? For those who might not be familiar with downtown or the commons, can you tell people how to get there? Absolutely. Columbus Commons is one block south of the State House. It's adjacent to the Ohio Theater and right across High Street from the Lazarus Building. It's where the former city center mall used to be. A lot of people had their holiday memories there. And when we had to repurpose the mall and repurpose the site, one of the things we really wanted to hold on to were those memories that people had, but maybe a 2.0 variety. So now it's a big green space and you can't miss the lights. I think you could see them from space. 400,000 LED lights in every color imaginable. That's amazing. So tell me more about the display. I mean, what, what is it? Well, it's everything from ornaments and balls and old fashioned ornaments that are gigantic size, Christmas trees, and a lot of holiday displays, and then just lighting up all the trees, the bushes, everything we have in the park. We've been able to bring all these lights to the community, of course, free of charge, 10 years that we've been producing them, thanks to our partner, the American Electric Power Foundation. Oh, good. So you mentioned that this is 10 years for the display. How has it changed over the years? What have you seen since it began? Well, we started off with probably 100 or 150,000 now we're up to more than 400,000 lights. 
So the first thing that's changed is just the sheer number and volume of it. The other thing is, as the trees have grown over the 10 years, so have the lights. We have more trees to light. It feels fuller. And then our team really every year wants to come up with something new and creative to do. How you look at the pavilion, what we put on the two LED screens, and then at the gateway at Town and High. My favorite display is always the large Christmas tree. You can walk right up to it. It's a great photo op for those of you into Instagram. And especially on a year like this year, people are looking for things to do. They're looking for things to do with their families. I know I am. And we are providing that safer option. You can walk through it. You can drive. This is, I think, a great opportunity to do it and still be respectful of all of the health guidance that we continue to get. That's wonderful. So how long do people have to see it? How long will it be up? It's going to go through January 3rd, and it's lit every day between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. And another nice part is if you're downtown, the Scioto Mile, which is another park that Columbus Downtown Development Corporation built, and it's managed by the city of Columbus, they light it up. So you can do a little walking tour, start at Columbus Commons and see our lights, walk down Town Street and along the riverfront and see all the lights that the city's put up at the Scioto Mile. That's a great idea. What a special new tradition that could be for people. Absolutely. We're so lucky to have this in Columbus and I'm so excited to go. I can't wait. Great. Well, I hope you have a wonderful time. Snap a picture, tag us on Instagram or Facebook at Columbus Commons and uh, let us uh, see your pictures or how you see the Commons. Amazing. Well, thank you, Amy, so much for talking with me. I've learned so much. Great. Thank you and happy holidays to everyone. The holiday lights are on display at the Columbus Commons until Sunday, January 3rd. Visit columbuscommons.org for more details. Well, it is time for another installment of Kate's Quick Bites. Today, I'm sharing a fruity and boozy red wine cocktail that was sent to us by Columbus artist Charlotte Belland. Charlotte is also the chair of the animation department at CCAD, so it seems fitting that there's a playful cartoon connection to her Sing To Me Sangria. But make note, this recipe is for adults only. Hi, Charlotte. Thanks for talking with me today. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. So for those not familiar with this drink, give us your definition of a sangria and what makes it so special and delicious. I like the very, very traditional idea that sangria is a punch and it's basically sugared wine. So I picked this recipe because this is one that uh, my wife and I have kind of changed and, and worked with over the years. Uh, we served it at our wedding reception. Uh, so it's very dear to us in terms of that, but it's evolved over many, many years. First thing we do for this sangria, uh, we pour a whole bottle of wine into this pitcher. So gotta love any recipe that starts with pour a whole bottle of wine into something. We're using a Shiraz. You can use any dry red wine for the base of the sangria. So here we go. Next, we're gonna add one whole can of Sprite. Next, we're gonna add the juice from a 20 ounce can of pineapple. All right, I'm gonna add a couple pineapple rings in. Look, they just vanish. There we go. Nice. And we'll save these for garnish. Do you consider this like a drink for all seasons or is this sort of a sit on the front porch in the summer or what do you think? It definitely for our house is a drink for all seasons. Nice. So we enjoy it uh, year round. Um, you can actually make it pretty quick as long as um, the stuff is refrigerated. Um, I find that that's really helpful that we keep the, the can of pineapple in the refrigerator and that's we smart. Keep the red wine in the fridge and that way it's just it's it's all cold and ready to go it's 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 better when it's cold i guess is the best way right. to describe it now it's time for the citrus we have an orange a lemon and a lime and i'm going to go ahead and cut out just a slice from each one that we're going to add to the pitcher and then we'll juice the rest of the citrus so here we go <laughs> Now I'm gonna juice all the citrus and add the juice to the pitcher. All right, there's all of our citrus. Okay, our Sing to Me Sangria is almost complete. We have two more ingredients to add. We're gonna add peach, schnapps, and grenadine to round it out. So I wanna talk about your method for measuring. You titled this recipe Sing Along Sangria, which is sort of alliterative and just fun, but tell us more about that. Right. Um, I, I'm, I looked up and it said something about a certain amount of ounces is a certain amount of um, time in a pour, having a right spigot. Obviously I am not as sophisticated as a, um, 
as a, as a bartender. Sure. Initially, I was using uh, uh, Intergalactic by the Beastie Boys. Yeah. Um, I like my sugar with coffee and cream, which is about three seconds, which is a pretty big pour. Right. Um, but because I started adding so much pineapple to it, um, and there are pineapple rings, um, the SpongeBob uh, theme song, Who Lives in a Pineapple Under the Sea, seems to kind of fall within that two to three seconds. So I'm going to add the peach schnapps, and I'm going to sing... SpongeBob SquarePants song, because that's what she does. Okay. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? I thought that was not too much. Just enough? Okay. Now you get to hear me sing again. Ready? With our grenadine? We're almost, I mean, this is going to be good. Okay. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? Did it. Now we should just stir it up and drink it. Um, I think we just had a guest show up. Do you want to introduce us to who's on your lap? Sure. So we we love our sangria so much that uh, this little Yorkie is sangria. That makes me so happy. Sangria, we're talking about sangria. <laughs> All right, our Sing to Me sangria from Charlotte Belland is complete. It's beautiful. It smells incredible. So all we have left to do is put a few fruit garnishes in our glass and have a taste. Oh yeah, Charlotte, this is a good one. We've got Charlotte's full recipe for her Sing to Me Sangria online at wosu.org slash Kate's Quick Bites. And check out Charlotte's daily animal drawings on Instagram. You can find her at Bell and Pixel. Who would think that to protect a delicate piece of artwork that is centuries old from further degrading would be to put it in a tub of water? Okay, well, maybe it's a little more complicated than that. But still, last year we spent time with the folks at the Columbus Museum of Art as they embarked on a project to preserve the quality of 50 fragile works of art from its vast collection of European old master prints, some of which date as far back as the 1600s. Here's a peek into their process of conservation. We are in Gallery 5, and we are surrounded by 24 of the old master prints that were conserved as part of our grant from Bank of America. I mean, you, you come to museums and you see everything looks wonderful and the works of art all seem, you know, in wonderful shape, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources to sustain your collection and make sure your collection, the works that you're caring for for generations, are in the optimal shape they can be in. And we had this fantastic old master collection of prints, old master prints. And there were quite a number of these prints that we could never put on exhibition. We could never share them with the public. And so this grant allowed us to look at 50 prints from that collection and conserve them and get them in shape so they could be shared with the public. Uh, usually when you talk about old master prints, you're really talking about Renaissance and Baroque. So you're talking about sort of 15th through 18th century prints. We are looking at the Albrecht Durer Melancholia. And you see on the screen a photograph of the before treatment image. Prints uh, from Durer's period of 1600s would normally not show this degree of discoloration unless some uh, outside influence had uh, caused advanced acid degradation. Uh, other problems are less obvious to the untrained eye and they have more to do with ongoing acid degradation of the paper, the cellulose fibers. Um, and that can cause embrittlement to the paper and discoloration, which is visually disfiguring to the works and makes them unsuitable for exhibition. It also, more importantly, it can significantly uh, decrease their lifespan if those acids are not neutralized and removed from the paper. Now, what we saw on the computer screen was uh, the before treatment uh, condition. Uh, and this is the Durer print after treatment. And you see that the extent of reduction in discoloration is uh, considerable. 
Many of these works have never been exhibited at the museum because they weren't you know, in the condition to be able to be shared. So this is a very exciting moment for us. The term conservation was applied to represent two distinctly different approaches to artworks. One is restoration and one is preservation. The goal of restoration is mainly appearance. The goal of preservation is making something last longer. So we draw a little from each of those, a little bit from restoration, a little bit from the goal of preservation, and that mix is what modern conservation is about. Paper, it's very interesting. It's actually a great pleasure to work on older pieces. Oftentimes, the older they are, the better quality materials that were used, and they actually hold up better over time. Paper has to have a, a cellulose source, and it can be wood. In the past, it was more commonly cotton and linen. We call these older papers rag papers because they were literally ground out of used rags. That produced a very high quality paper. It was almost pure cellulose. So old master prints can be treated and come back to almost what they would have originally looked like uh, to these beautiful 100% cotton cream colored rag papers. Moved to the 19th century, uh, that source of rags disappeared and so they began to use wood. Just like your newsprint turns dark brown when you leave it sitting on your table, well that's what happens to artworks that have wood pulp paper and uh, uh, fibers in the paper. You can actually give paper, works on paper, because the museum has a very extensive work on paper collection, you can give them baths. I mean, I can never imagine you could take a piece of, you know, and put it, submerge it in an alkaline bath, but you can. We're now in the alkaline pH range between, uh, it's approximately 8.5. It's interesting, the use of ultraviolet light in washing is uh, a very interesting thing because one of the things that damages paper the most is being exposed to too much light. But when we wash in alkaline water baths and we um, expose these papers under water to ultraviolet light, it has the opposite effect. We do try to glean as much information as possible prior to treatment so that we uh, know what we might come up against. In the case of the Vandevelde prints of the Four Seasons, Three of the prints were noticeably more degraded than the fourth. And what we discovered under the microscope is that the fiber content of three of those prints is different from the fourth. But we did have to treat the three that we discovered under a binocular microscope um, were of mixed fiber content, containing some straw that gave it an overall darker brown tone and also caused it to degrade more rapidly. So we treated those separately from the fourth print, which was done on 100% cotton rag fiber paper. All of the prints came in with various old paper tapes, um, animal glue adhesive on the reverse. These are all common, and we try to remove those because they do eventually uh, cause um, localized acid discoloration. <music> We are in the uh, storage room uh, at the Columbus Museum of Art. These are the prints that uh, we need to rehouse. This is an Albrecht Durer, uh, so it probably was made around 1503, 1518, so quite old. You can see that uh, the various stages of acid burn happening. So this is Jane Austen era. This is social commentary of the era, so 1808 social commentary. So the condition is, it's, it's got the good quality rag paper. Uh, it has some local stains, uh, but it is stable as long as we get it out of its current slightly acidic mat. No conservation treatment to reduce adhesive stains is recommended because it would require wetting the paper so much that it might do more harm than good. They suggested not even trying to remove this, um, uh, the leftover glue here for the same reason. You don't want this one to get too wet, you're going to lose the value of the hand coloring. 
Uh, so this really just needs to be put into the better mat. So it's a good candidate for rehousing. Our goal really is to preserve these for the future. And if we don't step in and slow ongoing age-related degradation, their lifespan will be shortened. This really makes a difference. It makes an entire part of the collection open to our visitors that weren't, that wasn't available before. That's our show. You can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. And be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you back here next week. Outside the window snowing, inside the chestnuts roasting, under the mistletoeing, up on the rooftop ho ho hoing. Now down the chimney squeezing, cookies and milk he's eating. The toys that he is leaving are not for fun, but they are for teaching. He wants to educate. He wants to, he wants to. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors, and viewers like you. Thank you.